Hi, everyone. Uh, this is another episode in our series, Paul's Contradictions of Jesus. This episode will be about ep- uh, contradiction number 28 of Paul of something Jesus said. Paul says God does not live in temples made of human hands, but Jesus says he does. This is going to be what I call the second irrefut- irrefutable proof of Paul's invalidity. We saw the last one was uh, another one of these. This is like, there's no comeback, but we will explore this. Somebody who actually attempted to uh, justify this contradiction, and we'll give you a full exposition of that, and you'll see how credible that is or not. All right, so here we go. Oh, uh, but first, we're going to play a, a short clip that gives you uh, an introduction to the whole premise of if What's the consequence if Paul contradicts Jesus? Well, what, what are we supposed to do with that? Paul himself tells us, he says that Jesus comes first, and even if himself contradicts Jesus, he's a man of pride, arrogance, and should be disregarded, not a man of God. So let's let Paul be the judge of himself. I, I, I'm not going to be judging him. He, his own words will judge him. So he'll, that'll be the next uh, segment. segment and- now, every episode uh, of the series will begin with this uh, segment here. And if you have already heard this segment, you're going to be able to skip it if you want. Uh, and th- the introduction here is to establish the ground upon which a contradiction of by Paul of Jesus is material, even in Paul's own admission. So um, let's begin. And we'll see here in The title of this intro is Paul supports the test of Jesus' words against his, Paul's own words, to validate or invalidate himself. So Paul admits that Jesus' words, if contradictory to what he says, are contradictory. He is invalidated as a man of pride. So let's continue. Let's begin the the, uh, article here. Paul says, anyone whose words contradict those of Jesus in his teaching is to be rejected as a man of pride. Paul thus endorses Jesus' words only as a test of orthodoxy. Paul says, If any man, which obviously includes Paul, gives different teaching not in agreement with the true words of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching which is in agreement with true religion, he has an high and high (laughs) he has an over high opinion of himself, being without knowledge, having only an unhealthy love of questioning and war of words, from which come envy, fighting, cruel words, evil thoughts. First Timothy six, verses three to four, basic Bible in English, and um that is one of the, more, the better translations. But I want you to see the literal, the interlinear of from Mount C. Let's read it here. If someone teaches a different doctrine and does not adhere or agree to the healthy or sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just adding there's a couple of things that other people, uh, the NIV, for example, would say sound and so on, or agree. So I'm just showing there's a, there is a range of meaning there too. So who do not agree or adhere to the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the teaching that is according to godliness, and and most other texts would say uh, and don't and and don't agree to the godly teaching or agree to godly teaching. He that person who contradicts Jesus and doesn't have godly teaching, either one. <laughs> He is puffed up with conceit, understanding nothing, but has a sickly craving for speculations. It, it, the craving there is nosio for speculations and fights about words, out of which come envy, strife, slanders, evil suspicions. So if Paul actually violates his own statements here, you can conclude he's a man puffed up with conceit, understanding nothing, but has a sickly craving for speculation, fights about words. Okay, so we're going to look at this topic, uh, 28th contradiction. Paul says God does not live in temples made of human hands, but Jesus says he does. This is also going to be the fourth contradiction of Yahweh in passages of Paul. Paul says, quote, God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands, Acts 17, verse 24. The Greek word for handmade is kairopoietois, and you'll see why that's important. However, Jesus said in a correction of the Pharisees who thought an oath offered by articles offered at the temple were binding, but not an oath by the temple at Jerusalem itself. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it, Matthew 23, 21. And of course, the temple Jesus was talking about is the one that was constructed at the orders of the uh, Nehemiah in the book of Nehemiah and the temple was rebuilt and that Jesus would know that historically just from the Bible itself. So he is saying that God does dwell at the temple at Jerusalem. Jesus elsewhere referred to the temple at Jerusalem as a quote, temple made with hands, Mark 14, 58. So there you get it, Cairo poetoin made with hands. 
So uh, if there was any question in your mind, is Jesus saying the contra- being contradicted by Paul? He's being contradicted in two points that Jesus says um, the Father dwells in, in a temple, and Jesus says it's made of human hands, and Paul says God does not dwell in a temple, and he also says it was not of one that is made of human hands. So that's not a temple that God lives in, according to Paul. Hence, Jesus clearly said God dwells in a temple made of human hands. Paul quite clearly says the opposite as a principle true at all times. The importance of this is that Jesus affirms God does live in a temple made of human hands, but Paul says this is untrue. So who's correct? Obviously Jesus. How does Paul? How do Paul defenders solve this passage? By sophistic distortion of God's word. And we'll get into that right now. Okay, so one of the um, most common techniques people do when they're really desperate to win an argument they can't win is they try to redefine terms. And so you'll take a definition out of the dictionary and then they'll tell you what it means, but they don't actually translate it or put it in different words that are synonymous. What they're going to do is they're going to make it more abstract to try to get the sense of something, to find it so much more broadly than than it is so that the original definition is just a small subset in a bigger term. And then they, what they've done is they subtracted the specific term. And now in an abstract sense, they're going to make you land outside the circle of the original meaning. So they subtract by abstraction. They make it abstract. They go up. And then when they come back down with the meaning, it's going to land outside where the other term was. And I know this is going to sound uh, difficult at first, but when you see my example, you'll understand it. And this will help you spot these kind of arguments one of my uh, roles here, I, I view, is to impart some of the knowledge as an attorney. I've learned this is exactly what lawyers do all the time because we have legal terms that are important and, and are crucial to outcomes of cases or uh, a language that's in a decision. So if you can abstract it out, subtract the meaning, and make it come down somewhere where it really wasn't originally, you can try to win. And so that's when we lawyers would call that sophistry meaning it's not really true. It's not a true argument. It's a way of winning. If you're underhanded and dishonest, you use sophistry. But a lot of people actually use it unconsciously, meaning they think it's actually a good argument or, or rational or appropriate to do this, but they're, they, they don't have enough self-awareness of what they're doing. And again, that's what professionals are trained. We are trained to spot arguments. We are trained on the spot to know what they are, know how to defeat them. And that's w- then what we do is we tell the judge what they did, and then bring it right back. And literally within seconds, the guy can go on for an hour and hour. And this guy is going to go on. We'll see the argument he makes. He goes on. He makes this redefinition right at the beginning. That's the mistake. If, if I were to just sit there as an attorney listening to him, I would wait till he gets to the end. I'd get up and I'd say, as you remember, Your Honor, the very first thing he said was he, he redefined terms. He subtracted the, he abstracted a meaning. And then when he came down, he subtra- subtracted the the true meaning and he made it mean something totally different from what it really did. And if I do it right, the judge will go, of course. And then all of the 29 minutes that followed his one minute introduction are all irrelevant because he redefined terms incorrectly. And that's exactly what we're going to see here. So I hope you can, I hope by me showing you this, you'll learn a little bit of the t- tricks of the trade of attorneys. And, and, I, and I never, I mean, I never would deliberately use, use sophistry. But, but you have to be trained in how it's done to be able to spot it and then defeat it in oral argument. All right. And uh, this is basically, it had a good source. Originally, uh, Plato believed in what's called uh, uh, empirical uh, knowledge. And uh, Aristotle said, hey, wait a minute, we have to have a more abstract knowledge. So this is where it comes from. And so you could literally take platonic ideas, change, abstract them, and then they don't read anything like Plato anymore. And that's what who Aristotle was. Anyway, it's a long story, but there's there's history behind it. There's logical uh, uh, analogies and so on that you have to be aware of. So you, you can't, you, you have to know how to define sophistry in this context. All right. So here's the article. It's in a, uh, a, a web page called Biblical Hermeneutics, and it directly goes right at the issue. Why does Paul say that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands? So they know the problem. And here's how they identify the issue. Even Biblical Hermeneutics was forced to ask, This is me introducing their quote. If the God that made the world and everything in it doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, then who dwelt in the tabernacle? What God dwelt in Solomon's temple? Paul's statement sounds like a contradiction. 
So they're admitting it sounds like a contradiction. So that's their clue. We don't think it's a contradiction because it just sounds like one, but it really isn't. But obviously on the face of it, what they really should say is on the face of it, it appears to be a contradiction. That's how I would put it. Will the one writing this then gouge, this is me, will the one writing this then gouge his or her eyes out to deny that they see a contradiction? So literally, people who jump to sophistry as their solution, they're going to make up a, a, a sophistic argument, means they know it doesn't work. And, and they're all they're doing is they're completely desperate and they have to do something because they can't let this case, they can't let Paul go away and Jesus can, and they, they don't even... Uh, uh, care about what Jesus says here. They don't even ever mention what I told you what Jesus said. So b bear that in mind. So they, they're they only saying that it's contradiction against what everybody knows. I mean, it's a universal fact that God dwelt in a temple made of human hands. I hope you all know that. <laughs> it's a fact this man can't get away from, but he's going to literally try to make it sound like it can be. And I'm going to, uh, you'll wait till you see, wait till you see what he does. So he's not even dealing with Jesus' statement. And what did I show you? Jesus says, what? God dwells, dwells at the temple, right? And everybody knows that's made with human hands. Then he again says, God dwells in a temple made with hands, human hands. So there's no way if he had cited these, you know, he'd be in a re really difficult position. Here he's, he's simply acknowledging that it just isn't true factually. Don't we all know that? And he's going to try to make you doubt doubt based on his re redefinition that, that this is even true that god was ever really dwelling in a dwelling sense that he's redefining he's going to redefine dwelling you'll see and that way you can think to yourself oh well he wasn't really ever dwelling at the temple and he's literally I'm gonna, let me run you i'm going to run to the conclusion just so you see i'm you're going to say this is crazy nobody can do come to this conclusion listen to this conclusion <laughs> wait a minute because it takes a while i'm going to try to do this fast though um here's here's the last sentence so there is much evidence that god does god does not dwell or live in a human made structures how about that <laughs> that's what that's where he's going and how did he get there by redefining terms what the word dwelling means all right so well, now we got to go back and we'll start at the top here so i again this is a i'm doing this more so you can see how people try to escape even when it's impossible <laughs> There, there's no limit to human ingenuity to deceive and delude themselves and, and in the process delude and deceive others. Whether he's doing it deliberate or not is not my point. It's an argument that probably he's deluded himself and he, he believes what he's thinking. And that's, I think, what you need to know. People can sincerely use sophistic arguments. They think they're valid for some wee reason that it's only in their head. I can't, I can't explain it. Uh, I, you know, uh, anyway. So... W w <laughs> Now, look at the hair-splitting manner he, that he does to deny the obvious. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 21, that God dwelled at the temple, which the author 100% ignores. Ignores what Jesus said. But the author claims Paul was right, that God does not dwell in the sense of living at the temple. I will share their proof, but bear in mind, A, Jesus contradicts the entire point of their proof. So before we even get started, don't forget that, that Jesus says the opposite. So that should be the end of the story, right? But I want you to hear, assume he even knew of what Jesus said, he would probably have to come down this way anyway and leave Jesus on the, on the side of the curb. And that's what Protestants usually do in, of the dispensational camp. They don't mind to point out that Jesus and Paul contradict because they believe Paul knew a different Jesus uh, who had ascended, meaning that that Jesus had a new transformation that he now had knowledge that the Jesus of the earth did not have. So it doesn't ma make any difference to dispensational Christians, let me put it that way. Usually, if there's a contradiction, they, they'll always say Paul had a superior revelation from the Jesus who was ascended. Anyway, so here's A, Jesus contradicts it. So to me, that's the end of the argument. But I want to train everybody's spot arguments. And thus, if their proof were binding, then Jesus would be a false prophet. So they, they, they'd be really, and that's, unfortunately, that's what dispensationalists who accept the contradictions and then accept Paul, what Paul is saying is saying that G the Jesus of earth was a false prophet. The only true prophet that was Jesus was the one who ascended and is somehow having these revelations, which Paul says he can't quote that Jesus, but that's the only Jesus that has has was really a true prophet, the one that's talking to Paul. And Paul is uh, therefore valid when the 12 apostles talking to Jesus of earth are not valid. I know you all don't, many of you don't know how dispensationalist works, but when you tear apart their arguments, they don't quite put it as bluntly as I would say what they're doing, but that's what it ends up being. Is that Jesus ascended? 
uh, is superior to the Jesus who was here. And Luther made that point. Je Luther said, Paul, who of earth, excuse me, Lu Luther said, Jesus of earth did not have the knowledge that the law was fading away. Only the Jesus who ascended, who talked to Paul, had knowledge the law was going away. Anyway, but I digress. So now, despite Jesus being a false prophet under this scenario, if you follow the logic here, and he doesn't reckon, he doesn't ex mention that passage, it's still a potentially, he's saying it's uh, potentially still a valid voice to say what Paul's saying. So Jesus is thrown under the bus, ignored in fact as if he's even spoken on this issue, and Paul is elevated as unfalsifiable. You, you can never find him wrong. He always has to, you always must rationalize whatever it takes for him to always come out on top. So here is the argument to prove Paul correct and Jesus wrong. We know that, even though the author is not acknowledging it, and that God does not in fact dwell in sense of live at the temple of Jerusalem. Never did. Never lived at the temple. So he's changed dwell into live. And we'll see uh, when we say we live someplace, it means it's like the only place we live. And so he's going to use proofs that God, you know, was dwelling in heaven. So he can't live on earth. <laughs> see, so you could, we'll get there as we go. So uh, I'm going to stop here just to make sure I don't uh, lose this audio. Sometimes that happens. So I'll be Okay, and what he's going to do that's wrong is right at the beginning. So I'm not going to have to go through all the pages of references, but it's right here. It's going to tell you what the definition is of the word dwell in Greek. And he's going to use a recognized dictionary, BDAG. So he's going to say to dwell means to live in a locality for any length of time, live, dwell, reside, settle down. Now, please do not forget what he has here. This is what he's going to ignore throughout his definition. So I'm going to make a point of you seeing it. Because you can't ignore what it really means. <laughs> these, these other words are one word synonyms. Dwell means live. Dwell means dwell. Dwell means reside. Dwell means settle. So you have to see it means this is the, this is the part of it that gives you the meaning of the word. Then you can see what are synonyms of the word. Then it says to make something a habitation or dwelling by being there, which, by the way, is again, it's a simply it's a length of any time. You, you, you can dwell someplace if you're there for, you know, a day or two days, whatever. You don't have to be there all the time. And again, humans, by the way, living places can only live in one place at a time. But God can do what? He can dwell in multiple places at a time. And that's the flaw in a lot of his later arguments. It's all about this word dwell and living someplace. So uh, I, so I'm going to I'm going to use repeatedly through here. I'm going to give commentary on what he's saying and by doing it. You'll see it says Doug here. I wish to intervene and show the gyrations the writer later ignores the words to live in a locality for any length of time or the present gerund by definition in two, number two. So this is a present gerund by being there means, you know, do you dwell there? It means you're presently staying someplace, right? So that's all it means. Um, all right, I'm just going to move on. Uh, then he says this. So no, I'm gonna, every time I go back to him, I use this heading. So biblical hermeneutics says regarding the second definition, so that's what he likes. He doesn't like the first one, see, but he's going to point that something, uh, a habitation or dwelling by being there. So assuming what that means is you have a house or a structure and you are being there. And, but for, it doesn't have to be a long period of time. It just has to be a, a period of time. You're being there. All right. But he's going to focus on it of dwelling, being there. Also implying for any significant period of time. So I, I, to me, this means any significant of time equally qualifies here as there. So the only difference is one is a locality and the other is a habitation or dwelling. So one is a structure or building of some sort and the other is a locality, which could be an area, a community or geographical position. But regardless, it doesn't matter. They each have this idea. It's any length of time by being there for even a you know short while, you are dwelling someplace. Important to know these things. All right. So he's now going to uh, define it right here differently. Regarding the second definition, the idea of both habitation and dwelling is that you is one to live as a resident. What has he done? He's added. So in the second definition, do you see the word resident anywhere? No. What is he doing? He's trying to draw an abstraction, something that's more uh, uh, above or higher up level. That would be, you know, a way of viewing it from a higher level. Oh, it must be a resident. And what you've done is you then abstracted it and made it, you've subtracted. You've subtracted the meaning that was originally there. And now you basically have abstracted 
subtracted, and now you've added a new meaning that it wasn't there in the first place. So when you come down and land to try to refute things, you're going to always have this new qualifier. You were a resident there. If God is, if you can make an argument that God isn't residing there on a regular basis, like he has a home in heaven and he's a home down here, well, he's not really residing here. He's really residing in heaven. Now you're going to create a conflict and you're going to try to argue he's not really here. Things like that will happen. So let's see what he does with this. Um, then he, Biblical Humanotics picks it up again. This fits in many descriptions of God's dwelling, all quotes from the New King James, unless otherwise noted. So he's going to say this idea of dwelling fits many of the type, types of dwelling of God in the Bible. Okay. And then he'll cite uh, Exodus 15, 17, and he says God creates his dwelling place. Okay. And so th you would think that this is disproof of his claim, but, but we'll, you'll have to wait and see. The Lord will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Okay. Exodus 23, 19 is one of the many passages that references the house of the Lord, but the term need not, impl not imply a place for living or dwelling. So you see, now he's defined living is like, a, like you and I would live someplace. <laughs> And so he's trying to say it's not really, just the, the fact that it's called a house does not imply it's a place for living. Now, I'm sorry to say that's not true. A house implies a place for living. So this is false. So now he's doing not just sophistry by adding the word resident before. He's now, he's now actually uh, uh, falsifying, uh, he's, he's denying the meaning of words. The word house does mean a place for living. It, so it, it, it does need to imply something that it means. So he's taking, he's subtracting again, but this time to, to contradict the meaning that was already there in the word. So the definition had the meaning of living in, in a structure. I showed you that when you look at these other words, habitation or dwelling, they, those are structural like concepts as opposed to locality, right? So he's now erasing that when it says, says God speaks of a house. So it's just, again, that's really, uh, that's that's not, that goes beyond what I was talking about, subtraction by abstraction. This is subtraction by re, uh, negation, basically contradicting the word of, of meaning of something. So he's doing multiple things at once. To me, that's always what I call dishonest argument, whether you mean, mean to do it uh, honestly, or excuse me, if you mean to do it innocent, innocently, it doesn't matter. It's still dishonest. And, and, and then my job as an attorney would be to point it out during oral argument. This is not an honest presentation. That's how I put it. Because it's, it's you know, you can't say, Your Honor, that you can redefine the term living as not being, this, a house is not a place you would necessarily live in. And that a house is, is a, by definition, would mean that. <laughs> that means a house you would live in. That's what a house is, by definition. So we'd have to go bring up the, the dictionary book and show a house is a place people reside in, you know, things like that. So that's how you would have to prove it. And and I say it, honestly, to me, this is idiocy, Id idiocy and incredible. But you you would say, Doug, you're wrong. You, you haven't seen this webpage. These are these look like people who are legitimate, you know, biblical hermeneutics. These are these are people who claim to be Christians, Protestants, Pauline Christians. I mean, the whole bag, and they go through a whole long argument. And they think they're convincing the people in the pew that you should accept Paul by giving you what ridiculous statements, <laughs> idiot, idiotic statements. To me, it's idiotic to say a place, uh, a place that's called a house is a, is not a place that you would live in. Does not mean you live there. Meaning, he's trying to uh, say God could be staying in a house. But that would not imply he's dwelling in a house. See, the word house would imply you're dwelling, right? If you're if you're living there. But he's saying no, it doesn't necessarily mean you're dwelling just because you're living in a house. It's ridiculous. Okay, we'll continue. Biblical hermeneutics again. Regarding the second definition, the idea of both habitation and dwelling is that is to live as a resident. Okay. So I already went over that. And that's that he was adding a term and he's trying to try to extend out living it has to be kind of a significant period of time. Oh, okay. So let's keep going here. Okay. So here we go. Exodus 29, verse 45, 6 only states that the Lord's locality in relation to people. And indeed the ta tabernacle in verse 42 is simply the meeting place for God to speak with his people. So now what he's trying to say is the idea of God having a tabernacle and he's correct. It was called a meeting, the place of meeting. And he's saying, see that tabernacle isn't a place he would actually dwell in. So, so far, you know, he's trying to make it sound like the Bible isn't even talking about God ever ending up in a temple. 
So remember, why would you even discuss this? Because we know there's going to be two temples coming. Why, why waste our time about a, a tent of meaning, which was a movable tent, right? So again, he's distracting. This is, this is a third type of argument. What he's doing, he's trying to distract the, the viewer, listener, whatever, to think about something that's irrelevant. And that you would de definitely say is not the same thing as a temple, and you would therefore say, yeah, he may not do. He may not be dwelling at a tent. A tent is not a house, right? It's not a physical structure that has some level of permanency to it. It's very temporary. So that would fall outside the realm of what we would consider a, a dwelling place. So he's what is he doing? He's using a false example. So he's this is his second misleading, or uh, as I would be talking to the judge, it's not an honest presentation to tell you that you should look at a comparison to a, a t tabernacle, a tent, with what we're really talking about is did God dwell in a temple? And we all know he dwelled in two temples, the first and the second temple, and they were both destroyed. So that's how I would tear this apart in an oral argument, just to show you how lawyers do this stuff. But you have to identify each of these little points as they go. So again, I'm hoping by showing you how lawyers think that you will yourselves do what I do when people make these arguments and you can help them. You're trying to help them find Christ. That's the ultimate goal. So what do you, if, if you win this argument, they're going to realize Paul's a false apostle, false po a prophet. He, he cannot possibly be from God if he's claiming God never dwelled in a temple made of human hands. I mean, that, that, that's just, and, and at the time he's saying this, the temple has not fallen in, and that falls in 70 AD and Paul dies several years before 70 AD. So there's no way he could have been talking about anything but his own time. Okay. Anyway, so here's, here's the next thing. So he's going to say, but this is funny is uh, in the same context where it's talking about a tabernacle, it says God will dwell among the children of Israel. So he's right. The locality in this case is a locality in relation to people, not in a house or structure. So he's correct. But you see, he is dwelling with the people. So he, so it turns out God can dwell with people, but without using a house or what we call a temple. So that's all he's proven there so far. And, and in Exodus 29, it talks about that. I will dwell among the Israelites. So is he dwelling in the temple? No, he is, he's, um, he'll move in the, um, the tabernacle, but where he's actually dwelling on a regular basis is with the people in general, not in a temple at that time because it didn't even exist. All right, let's look here. Then he, Numbers 35, 34, he says, Therefore do not defile the land which you inhabit in the midst of which I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. So this is another example. of Is this relevant to anything? Absolutely not. See what he's doing? God, God dwelling in a locality is not the second definition. He, he said, I'm talking about the second definition. Now he's trying to prove it fits within the first definition. Well, yeah, up to this point, he's dwelling and it's not in a temple. Sure, we got it. So why are you telling us about this? Nobody's claiming he's dwelling in, in a, when he's dwelling in a land or with people, that that's the same thing as dwelling in a temple. So again, it's just another abstraction. So this is the third or fourth time he's dis, the, the, the author is dishonestly, whether, and I would assume innocently, meaning not with deliberate, I mean, people think they're being smart by, by doing this type of tactic, but it's a lawyer will point it out to judge, Your Honor, it's, he's making a claim that God dwelling out in the land has something to do with the issue of whether God dwells in temples made of human hands. And of course, Your Honor, no, that's not true. So I have to literally tell the judge, it's not true. Meaning the guy is lying to you, but I don't use the word lying. That's not uh, pro pro uh, professional or uh, not, you know the way we talk as lawyers. But you, in your heart, have to know what's really going on. This guy is lying to the judge, and you have to say it in a very nice way that he's, he's, he's not telling, the, he's being dishonest or untruthful, but didn't do it in a nice way. All right, here we go. Deuteronomy 12, verse 5, puts the context of God's dwelling more localized to a specific tribe. So now he's telling you he's dwelling with a tribe. Is he telling you yet anything about a temple? No. And there's plenty of temple passages he needs to look at, but he's wasting your time and my time telling us about things that don't matter. Yes, they, they dwell in the, God dwells in the tribes. Okay, who, 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 that's still not the issue. 1 Samuel 4, verses 4, is translated dwell at times in reference to the Ark of the Covenant. Now we're finally getting to something. Okay, what is the Ark of the Covenant? God would dwell between the cheru cherubim inside on the Ark. So the Ark of the Covenant had the Ten Commandments below below it, and God would dwell, a sit. Basically, it was like a sitting there. And now I want to be clear, God's not physically visible, seen, sitting there. He would usually be like a cloud or smoke inside of the temple, as people would describe it. Anyway, so, uh, but now we are talking about God dwelling 
physically in a physical area limited not to a locality of people or a tribe it's now a physical object that he can dwell on so it's like you know his think of it as god's easy chair if i said god's sitting on his easy chair inside the uh the temple that would be the same as saying he's dwelling at the temple so you would have to be now we're dealing with the correct issue but now he's got to prove that god doesn't dwell <laughs> on that ark Okay, how's he going to do that? The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, who dwells between, this is a quote of Ezekiel 10, verses 1 to 20. This is important. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim, this locates the exact place on the Ark where God meets. So this is his commentary on it. But it can be stated as well from other passages that re this represents the heavenly reality of God's living in creation be being surrounded by cherubim. All right, so now he's he's alluding to other passages he can't prove it from this passage that sit, god sitting between the cherubim inside the temple doesn't mean he's really dwelling at the temple he's saying if you looked at other passage this is represented as a heavenly reality of living in creation being surrounded by the cherubim so these cherubim are uh angelic characters okay so the answer to this is we don't have to speculate about other passages and we're and and if i were in a court argument i'd say your honor he he suggested there's some other uh passages that could support the idea that god sitting on the ark of the covenant with the cherubim next to him inside the ark as the ark excuse me in, inside the temple so in ezekiel 10 we're talking about the original temple the first temple when it's destroyed ezekiel is telling the event of the destruction of the temple in ezekiel 10 what happens god is sitting there inside the temple and it's going to be destroyed and then he's going to explain he sees the glory of god leaving the temple so this gentleman or whoever's writing this does not explain what ezekiel 10 is about but it's about the temple god sitting in there dwelling in there and then he has to leave because it's being destroyed he doesn't tell you any of that and he's now saying well uh, there are some other so if i'm talking to a judge i say there's he's claiming there's other passages that re represents that when god's sitting on the ark between the cherubim we should understand he's not really dwelling in the in the temple he's dwelling in some place with his creation in some heavenly reality uh, you know some zone of heavenliness that we can just ab abstract and, and and look at the temple and, and even though ezekiel's going to explain that he could see the smoke and the cloud lifting out of the temple uh, when the, the the Babylonians are coming, and 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 he sees all of that coming out of the temple. We're supposed to just think that wasn't really God inside the temple, and the smoke doesn't have any real truth to it. I mean, so your, your Honor, I would say, Your Honor, this is a ridiculous argument that doesn't go anywhere because he doesn't address. Uh, he's le he's speculating about other passages that could undermine the conclusion that's natural and, and forced on us, which is that God does dwell at the temple made of human hands, the one that was made by Solomon. But I digress. Anyway, um, now here is the full passage. And, and when you read the full passage of Ezekiel 10, you'll see it, this is a the scholars will all mention here. Uh, this is a, a book by Legionnaire. I think Legionnaire is considered a very well regarded protestant uh, thing they say ezekiel in, in in chapter 10 saw the glory of the lord leave the temple and that's what this gentleman is claiming god is not really there he's not dwelling there and he's somehow in some heavenly realm with the cherubim although that's where the ark is and and that's where the cherubim are inside the temple and that's where he is rest sitting or resting or whatever so what is what does Ezekiel say he sees when the, the, the bad guys come and t try to destroy the temple? He says he sees the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. So it's his house, right? So, so there's the word house. There's your dwelling. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And then it, 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 just, it ascends and departs from the temple. Okay, so did he tell you, and this is what I said to the judge, I said, your honor, did he tell you exactly what the what's going to happen next that these cherubim that he's god was sitting at he's inside the temple and he's visibly seen by ezekiel leaving in a cloud so god obviously is dwelling there in a temple made of human hands by solomon himself that's how i would do it in court <laughs> crush the guy that's the this is the only way you have to but you have to be nice with people who have opposing views particularly if they're christians and they're very uninformed we are the most uninformed uneducated people about christianity about the bible about any of these things think what i'm showing to you sounds like i'm crazy right like oh you know god 
came out of the temple in a cloud. But well, why won't they? Why didn't they ever teach us that? We we didn't we we thought God just is mysteriously always living in heaven. Does God really dwell in temples made of human hands? Paul said no. And well, that's why we got to read the Bible to know Paul is false. And if you don't read it, and they don't, your pastors won't teach you these passages. You're going to be left in darkness, and you're going to fall for the wrong person. Instead of Jesus saying that God dwells in temples made of human hands, you're going to fall for the guy who says God does not dwell in temples made of human hands. It's a life changing event when you make this decision to follow Christ versus Paul. <laughs> you actually, it's it's truth versus a lie and darkness. That's all I can tell you. It's just so on the surface true. Now watch this. I mean, it's going to get even worse. You thought I'm, I'm not kidding you. I mean, this is like a straightforward Christian Bible hermeneutics website. Second Samuel 7, 2, David states the ark of God has a dwelling in the tent. Great. But it's a tent to say, maybe that's what he's worried about of which he wants to make a house. So it's not yet a house. It's just a tent. And that's true. And, but God declares in verse five, he has not desired a house. Now, this is really, this is what I call, this is lie number five. This, this one must have to be deliberate. Because if you go to verse five, tell me where it says God says he doesn't desire to have a house. Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? Do you see any, I don't want to dwell there? No, are you to be the one? My son, David, he's asking him a question. He's not saying he doesn't want to dwell there. So this is, this is, so I would tell the judge again, judge your honor, he's mischaracterized verse five of second Samuel. It does not say he has not desired a house. He says, he's asking him, are you the one to build me a house? That's how I would exactly say it to the judge. And I, I'd be point blank embarrassing the opposing counsel because by this time he's made five lies and I'm crushing them one after the other. Boom, 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 boom. That's how you win cases. And people lose cases by lying and cheating and, and misrepresenting facts and circumstances. And they will... It's not my job to know whether they did it honestly or not. People do self-delude themselves. And you just have to say, I, I walk out of court hearings constantly where, where lawyers on the other side just make up stuff. And and this is what happens to them. And they, they walk out the door shamed. I don't know. <laughs> but my job is to destroy false arguments and bring them to the ground. That's, 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 that's what we do for a living. That's what we do as lawyers. Honest lawyers do do it so that they never, and they learn all these tricks so they don't do it themselves. You can't use lies. All right. Uh, now let's see. Burb, Bible hermeneutics. Uh, he has also been with David wherever he has gone. So even in David's travels away from the tabernacle while running from Saul, instead God will what? When your David days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set my seat after you and will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build the house for my name. Okay, so this is another kind of nonsensical argument. So God is going to have, presumably, this is really talking about Messiah. Messiah is going to build a temple for God's name at some later time. And now we can see there's two temples that will be destroyed by the time Jesus is, is uh, ascended into heaven, right? So if some, well, no, uh, Jesus ascends before the second temple falls. But after that, he's is still in, ascended and, and the temple falls in 70 AD. So Jesus is going to bring back a, a temple eventually, and that's what the book of Revelation is all about. There's a temple that's going to come down from heaven, so on and so forth, okay? So just because there's a future temple going to happen doesn't mean that there's no temple. God is not dwelling in temples made of human hands at some point in time in history, particularly at the time Paul is writing. 70 AD is several years away from Paul's death, so he can't be saying that, the, the, I mean, he has to be super ignorant not to know this temple exists, but yet he's lying to the group of Athenian uh, uh, philosophers at Athens. Why would you lie to them? Are you just being a people pleaser? He said, "If I please, uh, if I please, if I try to please all men, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a deceiver." <laughs> so that's his own words. You know, I he if I were a people pleaser, I would not be serving God. That's what he said. But so he's got to live with it. All right. Uh, now this is where it gets really outrageous. First Kings eight twelve to thirteen. Solomon believes incorrectly. His he is fulfilled, making that eternal dwelling. And what he's saying is, see, incorrectly, this implies only Jesus will make the one temple. So what he's trying to say is that um, that David has, excuse me, Solomon, Solomon believes that he has actually made a temple that God will dwell in. And what this gentleman is saying that Solomon was deceived, he wasn't really making a temple that God would dwell in. So this is to this is to destroy the idea that the first temple, which is Solomon's temple, was really a place that God would dwell in. And he's saying. These are his words. I didn't put these words in here. He says this. In David, Solomon believes incorrectly he has fulfilled making an eternal dwelling for God. 
And by the way, people need to know the word eternal usually means, even in Hebrew, age enduring, but it's translated as eternal, so it makes him look like he's wrong, but he isn't wrong. So age enduring is all that really meant there. Uh, all right, so here is, here is the quote. Then Solomon spoke. The Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built, so he's saying I built with human hands, you an exalted house and, you, and and a place for you to dwell in forever. See, now the forever is what the guy's focusing on. See, he, he thought he was making a temple forever, but it ended up getting destroyed. Now, the truth be known, also, you could say it even was intended to be forever. God said, though, if you uh, uh, abominate the land, like what they did is they did not do any uh, annual, uh, was it? I think it was the annual Sabbath. God was angry for them for, for 50 years they had su su suspended keeping the Sabbaths of the land. And so God made a specific rule to let your land rest fallow. I think it's one year out of five. I can't remember. So in order to make up for that time, God said, I'm going to exile you for the land so the land will get its rest. And so people don't know that part of the history either for whatever reason. So they don't understand they were exiled in punishment for not uh, to basically force a repentance on them to fix what they didn't do didn't do properly, which was to let the land life follow, fallow for a total of 50 years. And now the land's going to get it all at once. And it really did. It was just basically abandoned for 50 years. And then they went back right on time. All right. Anyway, the point is this, that uh, this is where he's going to say the, the word forever is means, see, he didn't, he didn't accomplish his task. And, and you know, and so this isn't really a true, tr there's nothing true about what he believes here. He, he thought he was building a house for God to dwell in, but since it wasn't forever, therefore God never even dwelled there. And that's ridiculous. See, it's this is the logic you, you have to deal with. And I would crush this again in oral argument. Like, <laughs> what are we talking about, Your Honor? He dwell, God, everybody knows God dwelled at the temple from the time Solomon built it and the time the, the, the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, okay? And the fact that it didn't last forever was not God's fault. It was man's fault, okay? That, and if... You know, we could go. Th you could go through the semantics of the word forever as well to to rebut this, and we should learn all these counter arguments. All right. Uh, so, and this is again. Okay, this is me talking here. All right. Um, I'm going to skip some of my arguments here. Now, this is them again. So far, evidence suggests that God never claimed to dwell in a particular structure made by people. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So what did he do? He just he just eviscerated the word the word, God's word. God's holy word has been eviscerated because the word forever is a hang up for this guy. Solomon says I I built the temple and I made it for God's eternal dwelling and because I made it for his eternal dwelling but we did so a bad, such bad sinning that God had to destroy uh, the, 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 we had to lay fallow the land, which included devastating the temple. I, you know, now it can't be God. God never even dwelled there. I was, you know, we were, we were deluding ourselves that he was really there. I mean, this is the nonsense that this is, you have to believe biblical hermeneutics. You have to accept complete nonsense. Let's keep going here. Um, all right. And then he says, uh, God's uh, heaven, the, the God's dwelling place in heaven is an eternal dwelling. Well, of course it is. It, it, but that doesn't mean there's he can't dwell anywhere else. So that doesn't imply. Um, and then he, oh, the worst of all is to say, because Jesus, Paul says that our bodies is now a dwelling place of the Lord, means that God does not dwell in temples made of human hands at all, ever. He said God does not dwell in te a temple made of human hands. That was his characteristic. So now that allegedly Paul is saying, and by the way, he has no foundation for this. Is God dwelling in each one of us? Giving us his Holy Spirit is not the same thing as dwelling in us. Jesus had God dwelling in him, but that was not just simply the Holy Spirit. But God literally dwelt in him because he, he was completely holy, like a temple has to be. Uh, unfortunately for all of us, pretty much we don't qualify in that category. So I would pretty much say you're, you're, you're grateful to have the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't mean you are a pure, as pure enough as you would need to be to be a temple. And that's a much more sacrosanct situation. So I think, I mean, that just calls into question this. But the point is this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, that does not answer the fact. God can exist in us and he d even dwell in us. He can dwell in heaven. He can dwell in us. It does not negate the fact God dwells in temples made of human hands and did so at the very time Paul was speaking. He made a categorical statement. Let's go back to it so we have a clear understanding. Paul did not say 
he dwells in human beings and therefore he doesn't have to dwell in the temple anymore. He moved out somehow. What is Paul saying? Let's listen. God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. False, false, false on every level conceivable. Right? Just because he, he dwells in heaven too, or just because he may dwell in believers also, if you believe that's possible, doesn't change the fact that he does live in a temple made of human hands and he does at Jerusalem and had been for quite a long time, since 444, I think approximately 444 BC. So like to over 400 years, Paul, it's like he's a biblical ignoramus. I mean, Tobias Singer says he's a biblical ignoramus and sometimes you wonder, or he's the biggest charlatan uh, fraudster there is on earth trying to con job these uh, Athenians into believing that the God of Yahweh is like their God who doesn't dwell. Their gods, by the way, don't dwell in temples made of human hands. They dwell on Mount Olympus. There is no temple there and they don't dwell in temples with people. There are sacrifices that are done to their gods, but their gods are visitors and don't dwell in those temples. So the, the temples to a, a pagan were, uh, you know, outside the service time, there was no presence of the God in their, their physical buildings. Okay, so just so we understand that, and that literally their gods were always at Mount Olympus. So this is this is a totally different Christianity and Judaism. Well, Christianity of Jesus is very different from pagan religion. Christianity of Paul is very similar to pagan religion because God doesn't even dwell in a temple made in human hands. He only, you know, he's in his he heavenly realm, his mountain, his holy mountain. Sounds just like if you redefine God to be limited in those ways, he sounds just like a pagan god. Uh, and then he's going to say, you know, uh, Zechariah 2, verse 10, place a location in relation to people for God's future dwelling. Okay, so so what? That doesn't mean he didn't dwell in a temple made of human hands when Paul spoke. You haven't proved that Paul told the truth. And then he says, so see? So there is much evidence that God does not dwell or live in human-made structures. Wow. Wow. All I have to say is this. So if I were in court, I'd say, Your Honor, and the ultimate conclusion he reached has absolutely no support. And anything he said is contradictory to reality, to fact, everything we know about the Bible, everything we know about the first temple, the second temple, everything Jesus said about the first and second temple. So it's completely false. And please find the defendant, Paul, guilty of being a false prophet. Thank you. And what, what, what could the judge say? He has to make a ruling. He, you, and that's what every Christian listening to me has to do. You have to make a decision. Is Paul a false prophet or was he telling the truth that God does not dwell in temple in human hands, therefore invalidating everything we read in the law and prophets and Jesus himself, making only one person survive? And that's Paul, your guy, Paul. You're trying to go to heaven just on what Paul says is true, even though you it throws Jesus under the bus, throws Moses under the bus, throws all the law and prophets under the bus. And so when people accuse us or me of throwing out, you know, you're throwing out half the New Testament when you throw out Paul. I'm saying, wait a minute, I'm protecting Jesus and I'm protecting, I'm, I'm, I'm raising verses that protect Jesus. I'm raising his words against Paul. And by doing that, I'm defending Christ. I'm trying to, <laughs> and I get all kinds of pushback. People are just so enamored with Paul. They just cannot let go. They cannot let go. But I'm praying to God that this will be one of the messages. And that's why I called it the the second irrefutable proof of Paul's invalidity. Okay, I've gone a little long, but God bless. Take care, everybody. Ciao, bye.